Steve Albini, who very sadly passed away in May 2024, was an incredibly important figure in the US indie scene of the 80s and 90s, helping to define and evolve genres like indie rock, alternative rock, grunge, shoegaze, and more. His influence is heard on several thousand records he produced and engineered over the years, most notably including the Pixies album Surfer Rosa and Nirvana's In Utero, among many others. Albini had the ultimate punk rock spirit, and what I mean by that is he was totally uncompromising when it came to his stance on the music industry and big corporate record labels. He despised the fact that big players in the music industry would exploit bands and artists for their own gain. For him, it was music first, bands first, artistry first. He told The Guardian once that he hated the term producer, he insisted on being called an engineer instead, because as he saw it, his role wasn't to mould or shape the sound of the band, he was merely there to record it and bring their vision to life. He would also refuse to take any royalties from his work, because he thought it was unethical to take money from the band after the album had been produced. For all intents and purposes, Albini was one of the good guys in music. He was a glimmer of hope in an otherwise declining industry, as capitalistic and commercial interests overtake that of the music itself. And when Nirvana came to him after the astounding success of Nevermind, Albini saw a well-intentioned band in the grips of the corporate industry, on the cusp of milking them dry. So Albini was enlisted to produce, or engineer, Nirvana's third album, In Utero. And I love the story of how this album was created. I think it's a brilliant reflection of who Steve Albini was as a person and his principles when it came to music production. Hi, I'm Adam. Welcome back to Music Mongoose. For their third album, Nirvana had decided they would not like to repeat the sound of their second, the monumentally successful Nevermind which Krist Novoselic would refer to as a bubblegum record. For this one, they wanted to go back to their roots. In fact, while recording Nevermind, the band were frequently listening to Surfer Rosa by the Pixies. Cobain even called it his favourite album of the 80s. The producer, or engineer, responsible for that album was of course Steve Albini. So it was an obvious choice. Nirvana didn't want to be sellouts, and Steve Albini was known for his integrity in music production. Uh, safe to say, however, Nirvana's label and management weren't particularly on board. Dave Grohl told Q Magazine, Our A&R man at the time, Gary Gersh, was freaking out. I said, Gary man, don't be so afraid, the record will turn out great. He said, oh, I'm not afraid, go ahead, bring me back the best you can do. It was like, go and have your fun, and then we'll get another producer and make the real album. You see, Nirvana's label and management just wanted another Nevermind, and why wouldn't they? It made them millions of dollars. But Nirvana wanted to go back to their roots. Now, after a bit of back and forth between Steve and Nirvana, Steve decided to write a letter, and this letter would outline how he thought the recording process should take place. I'll leave a link to the entire four-page letter in the description for you to read yourself. In essence, he expresses his willingness to work on their album with a focus on minimal production interference, emphasising the importance of preserving the band's creative vision. He outlines his philosophy of prioritising the band's input over industry norms, rejecting royalties in favour of a straightforward payment model akin to that of a plumber, and stresses his commitment to delivering a genuine, unadulterated recording reflective of the band's live energy. So with everyone in agreement, in February of 1993, Nirvana headed to Minnesota. Fun fact, the band were booked in with the pseudonym The Simon Ritchie Bluegrass Ensemble as to not kick up a fuss on their arrival. Albini was first offered royalties from Gold Mountain Entertainment. He'd receive a bit of money for every copy of the album sold. This would have earned him around half a million dollars. However, sticking to his principles, he declined and instead opted for a one-off payment of $100,000. Also, as per Steve's conditions, the record company were not to be involved in the recording process in any way whatsoever. Cobain was immediately impressed with Albini's knowledge and recording technique, which captures the natural ambience of the room with a few extra microphones. 30 mics in total were used to record Grohl's drums alone. 
The distinct, strained and distorted guitar sounds throughout the album are from a Fender Quad Reverb amp, in which three of the four power tubes were broken or missing. And this is what Cobain wanted. The thing Kurt loved about Surfer Rosa so much is how Steve managed to capture the band and their natural acoustics just playing in a room together. No effects, no wizardry, just pure, raw music. Making records is a very straightforward process, it's not black magic. You put up a microphone and listen to what it sounds like. If it doesn't sound good, you put up another one. The basic track recording took around five days, with a couple days of overdubbing, then a further five days of mixing. The entire album was finished well ahead of the two-week deadline they had. This was testament to both the proficiency of Albini as a record engineer, but also to Nirvana as a prepared band. Kurt's lyrics were finalised most often on the day of the recordings. At one point, he sent someone off to get some cherry-flavoured lozenges for his sore throat, and those became the cherry-flavoured antacids in the song Penny Royal Tea. The entire recording process was very matter-of-fact. If a take sounded good, that was it. That was the track, done. It's what the band wanted. No painstaking micromanagement like they had experienced recording Nevermind. It was the easiest recording we've ever done, hands down, Cobain later told Nirvana biographer Michael Azarad. I thought we would eventually get on each other's nerves and end up screaming at each other. Despite Courtney Love appearing a week into the proceedings proving stressful for Kurt, both Nirvana and Steve were ecstatic with the final album. The sense of achievement and joy with this new record didn't last long, however. Cobain soon called Albini to tell him that Nirvana's A&R man hated the album. He thought there was too much effect on the drums, the vocals were too quiet, he also didn't think the songwriting was good enough. Nirvana's management were also very unhappy with the album. Despite the pushbacks from their label and management, Cobain insisted to Albini that the band thought the album should be released as is. At one point, Albini got a call from a journalist in Chicago who warned him that Geffen's publicity department had been in touch with them. The label were putting the blame entirely on Steve Albini for producing an unreleasable album. Steve responded by saying Nirvana recorded the album that they wanted to record. At this point, the word was out there. The upcoming Nirvana record was a dud, and it was Steve's fault. This put pressure on the band to rethink their approach to the album. Eventually, Cobain, ultimately unhappy with the sound, told Albini that they were thinking of remixing some of the tracks. Of course, Albini could see that their hands were being forced by their label. His worst nightmares in dealing with this sort of bureaucracy was coming true. Albini would even get a call from Christ backing up Cobain and telling him that the tracks needed remixing. Now, despite this, Steve stood his ground. He was adamant that the tracks could not be mixed in a better way. He was totally sure that they had got the best out of those sessions in Minnesota. In the end, Albini gave his blessing and two songs on the album were remixed by R.E.M. producer Scott Litt. All apologies and heart-shaped box, and they were released as singles. The rest of the album was exactly what Nirvana wanted people to hear. It was finally their album as recorded by Steve Albini, albeit with a slight mastering over the top as Nirvana wanted. Bob Weston, technician for the Minnesota recording sessions, would disapprove of the remastering. The stereo doesn't sound as wide, the guitar has been flattened out a bit. On the original mixes, the guitar would just leap out, but it's their record. If they wanted to remix a few songs and do a lot in the mastering, that's their prerogative. All that matters when you make a record is that the band is happy with the final result. Remember, Albini's whole thing was to record what the band wanted, not to shape or mould their sound in any way. For the record, Albini did also think that the mastering was a bit too much. He was disappointed when he first heard the album, and he thought it was better before all the tinkering. And sadly, Albini was blamed for all the drama that went on behind the scenes with this album. The media unfortunately painted him as the villain in this story. A few years later, Steve would say, The three members of Nirvana I have absolutely no gripe with whatsoever. Every other person they worked with was a manipulative piece of shit who was putting pressure on them, scapegoating me and shit-talking this great record they made. After this, work would all but dry up for Steve because of the bad word on the street pushed by Nirvana's label. In Utero would turn out to be Chris's favourite album from Nirvana. 
Where Nevermind reflects a nirvana molded by a commercialistic music industry, In Utero appropriately serves as their legacy, the type of music the band truly wanted to make, the type of music that was true to them. And despite the last minute tinkering, this legacy would not have been realized without Steve Albini. His character, his principles, his constant urge to throw a middle finger up to the music industry and record label giants is what made that album. It's what made Steve so incredible. Meanwhile, unbeknownst to them, the meteoric rise of Nirvana would soon spell disaster for indie and alternative rock across the globe. Click here to find out what I'm talking about.